I would like to first introduce uh, Professor Kortnov. Um, most of you uh, might have, some of you might have uh, read uh, his work, but uh, most of us uh, know him from, uh, from his scholarship. He is a professor of Entangled History of Ukraine, uh, based in Germany. Uh, he holds two master's degrees uh, from Warsaw and Dnipro in Ukraine. Uh, he has a PhD from the Ukrainian Institute in Lviv. And for the past um, 10 years, he's been based in Germany. Um, he's done several fellowships in, in Germany, both in Potsdam and in Berlin and in other places. Um, most of his research uh, concentrates on entangled histories of Ukraine, and he mostly looks at Ukraine and its relationships with uh, Russia uh, and Poland, and his recent book uh, entitled Poland and Ukraine, Entangled Histories, Asymmetric Memories, um, has just come out two years ago uh, in Berlin in 2020. Um, Andriy um, is also a very active uh, scholar in terms of uh, initiating uh, various research networks. So in 2015, he initiated uh, Prisma Ukraina, uh, which is a research network uh, devoted to Eastern European studies and is based in, in Berlin. Um, and uh, some of his research work has also looked at um, Ukraine's entanglements with, um, with Russia. And today he will talk about Ukraine's regional diversity, uh, mostly from the point of view of uh, linguistic diversity, religious diversity, and, uh, and political entanglement. And he will discuss as to why these different um, entanglements uh, have been seen historically as a problem and also contemporary as a problem. Um, so, Andrei, thank you again for being here and we're looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, dear Eva. First of all, I would like to thank you as well as Christian Noak uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of this event. And dear colleagues, I'm terribly sorry for not being able to come to Amsterdam. I've planned it, you know, till very recently, but unfortunately I've had to stay in Berlin because of some, I would say, family matters. Uh, my parents and my sister with small kids, they managed to get out of the war zone to Berlin, and there are some issues I have to take care of. Um, maybe I should also mention that Amsterdam played a very important role in my intellectual life, as I rightly said. I've been a fellow twice, twice, a fellow at the Neot Institute, so the Netherlands Institute for the Study of War. I should admit, uh, when it happened, uh, kind of uh, 12, 10 years ago, I would never imagine that the topic of war would be actually the topic of what is going on right now in Ukraine. But we have to face this reality and to understand it, of course, right? And in what I'm going to talk uh, today, actually, at least I'm trying my best to do two things. Uh, first of all, I'll try to show you some historical uh, dimension of what we know nowadays as Ukraine, because it's very important to be aware of the fact how the borders, geographical borders, language borders, religious borders of this country were uh, constituted. Right. And secondly, I would like to try to convince you, at least to start thinking differently about this, uh, as it said, regional diversity. What do I mean? I would say it immediately. I mean this, you know, very popular idea uh, that in case of Ukraine, there is a problem with the regions. Yeah, the problem with the so-called divisions Yeah, between East and West and so, so on. Uh, my uh, point is that actually we could conceptualize this diversity, those differences, in a much more positive sense. I mean, to con conceptualize them as an explanation of one of the reasons for the particular type of political and cultural pluralism that Ukraine has, especially if compared to its neighbor states. And this pluralism actually uh, rests very much 
on the diversity of the country. And in this sense, this diversity appears not as a danger or a problem or a trouble, but actually as a source of strength, also the source of strength when we are talking about Ukrainian resistance uh, to the Putin's aggression. Uh, so, uh, first and foremost, let me use this occasion, being at least virtually in Amsterdam, uh, to tell you just two words about our uh, chair and our university. You should be aware, dear colleagues, that our university, Viadrina, is located not just like far east, if you wish, from the Netherlands. It's located right on the German-Polish border, which also means that we have uh, lecture rooms and our offices on both Polish and German sides of the Oder River. And you see that's the picture from official web page of our university. It says solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, I could tell you that uh, my professorship is so far the only one in Germany, maybe even in the entire Western Europe. I am not quite sure about it, but in Germany for sure, with the history of Ukraine in its title. And actually what we are trying to do, me and my colleagues, we are trying to prove, as again, our moderator, Eva Stanchik rightly said, we're trying to prove that the proper way to deal with Ukrainian history is an entangled way of doing it. So, show, so using Ukraine, if you wish, as a key or a spectrum or prisma uh, to look deeper into the entire region, to understand better also Russian, Polish, Jewish, Ottoman history of this part of Europe. But of course, keeping Ukraine in the center of it, because otherwise, unfortunately, we have the problems, uh, a significant part of the European public opinion now have. I mean the problem how to understand the very fact that uh, Ukrainian resistance is so strong. And that's an important question. Also, maybe for our today's talk. So now what I'm going to do, dear colleagues, I will show you some maps, mostly maps, mostly maps. Uh, before starting doing that, I should remind you an obvious fact, but it's still important to remember that no map is neutral. No map is just an objective, you know, picture, yeah? Every map is, of course, constructed according to certain ideological, uh, cultural, whatever means. But still those maps will help us, hopefully, to feel this complexity of Ukrainian regionalism. And then, of course, we'll proceed to discussion. I am very much interested in your questions or comments. Right, so that's one of, uh, uh, I would say, pretty dangerous maps uh, because I found it on the internet, right? And this map uh, strives to show the various so-called regions of Ukraine. As you could see, there are a lot of them. Uh, probably the biggest is this one here, right? Southern Ukraine. Yeah, it also includes uh, the city where I was born. Uh, now it's called Dnipro, yeah, here, right? It also has, for instance, the notions of right and left bank Ukraine. In this case, it's about the Dnipro River or Dnipro River, this huge river that actually flows throughout the entire country. And here we have also some interesting names, as for instance, Eastern Halichina, Eastern Galicia, I should maybe immediately mention it and we'll come back to this issue later that this term, this category, Eastern Galicia, is a product of the Austrian imperial politics. This name was never used before the late 18th century. And the same would be true for many other names, like here the name Donbass, so the so-called Donetsk region, yeah, where the war actually started not a couple of weeks ago, but eight years ago right in 2014. Uh, in fact, please believe me, dear colleagues, it is very, very difficult indeed. I would never do dare to do it myself. So the author of this map dared, but he or she was a brave person. I would never dare to draw the precise borders between the so-called regions of Ukraine because there are no precise borders. The borders we have, they are administrative borders established in the late Soviet Union. And all the rest is kind of, you know, almost there or kind of there. So let us like look uh, deeper. Oh, this map. <clears throat> so this map is very interesting indeed. It was created, dear colleagues, before the First World War, right before the First World War, if you wish. It was done by a Ukrainian geographer, 
Stepan Rudnyski, who worked in Vienna. So he was also a student of uh, this Austrian German uh, geographical school. And as you see, uh, this map is called ethnographic overview map of Eastern Europe. So in other words, the guy tried to show the ethnic structure or ethnographic structure of Eastern Europe. So I'll show you Ukraine on this map and then I'll explain you why it's so important, why I would say even crucial to understand also the, you know, the next, um, the next uh, stages of Ukrainian history. So here, this kind of like gray big territory here, you see all around here, yeah, it's uh, according to Rudnitsky ethnographic Ukraine. If you look carefully at this drawing, you'll see that actually it very much corresponds to the present day borders, even though on this map, uh, this territory is even bigger than uh, post-Soviet Ukraine. And actually you see that uh, Crimea looks differently because uh, it's shown as a Crimean Tata ethnographic territory. Now, why this map is so fundamentally important? Why we need it? Uh, for our further analysis, because the Ukrainian national movement of the 19th century and of the early 20th century very much believed in the so-called ethnographic principle. In other words, uh, there was no Ukraine on the political map of Europe. Of course not. Of course not. There was the Russian Empire, the Austrian Empire. Uh, but uh, Ukrainian writers, historians, ethnographers, they believed that the entire territory where the majority of peasant population, because of course the majority of population was peasant yeah, in this part of Europe. So where peasant population speaks one of the dialects of Ukrainian language, this territory should belong to Ukraine, at least in terms of cultural autonomy or some cultural language rights. Please, please try to feel this logic deeper. So National movement claims we have rights to the territories where peasants speak predominantly Ukrainian, not Russian, not Polish, not Belarusian, not Crimean Tatar or any other language, but Ukrainian. In saying that, the Ukrainian national project, first and foremost, was of course strongly anti-imperial because it said, okay, we are aware of the fact that one part of Ukraine is in the Austria and another one in Russia. But for us, for our cultural program, for our cultural aspirations, they belong to the same territory, same country, same Ukraine. Uh, next important point, if we compare this Ukrainian movement to let's say two biggest competitive national movements, the Russian and the Polish one, we'll see actually that only Ukrainian movement made such a strong emphasis on ethnography or language because the Polish movement emphasized something else. The Polish movement emphasized the so-called historical borders. I'll show you some maps later. And civilizational mission in the Eastern Europe. The Russian project emphasized uh, also different things. For instance, it emphasized orthodoxy as a uh, religious denomination yeah, of the Eastern Slavs. It emphasized dynastic rights of the uh, ruling family right, Romanovs, and before them, Rurikovich. So uh, in doing that, uh, kind of, as we know that now, this attitude, this like ethnographic based attitude of Ukrainian movement proved to be extremely successful, extremely successful in political terms. And it also claimed, as you could easily imagine, it also claimed very strongly its democratic nature. Because if we are talking about historical rights, or dynasty, you know, it's not uh, it's not very democratic. Not only in our days, also in the late nineteenth century. And if we're talking about the right of the majority of population to use their native language, it was exactly the democratic project, and it was also a socialist project. Uh, that's not the topic for today, but we could discuss it later if you wish. That Ukrainian national movement in late nineteenth, early twentieth century was very much dominated by socialist parties, socialist attitudes, and socialist political programs. So keeping this story in mind, this idea of ethnographic Ukraine in mind, 
let us look briefly at the maps of the, let's say, previous history, let's say, how we got to this situation. Okay, that, that's a map of the medieval Kievan Rus. It's far away. Maybe the only one point to be made here, Kievan Rus was not a state in the modern sense of the world. Of course not, of course not. But what is interesting for us, look, look here at this kind of, let's say, uh, imagined border. It was the border between the Slavic settled population and the so-called wild steppe. So the terrain of various nomadic groups. Yeah, like here you see Kumans or Polovce. And that's an interesting story because uh, please keep it in mind. Please kind of keep it in mind this line, this borderline between the steppe region. Here is the steppe. Yeah. Plain, huge open territories, open fields, and the region of forests, woods. Because it will somehow, you know, reincarnate itself in the in the later political projects. Now, dear colleagues, that's a very important map. The map of Europe in 16th, 18th century. Here you have this huge state. You see it in a blue corner. This huge state was called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, or uh, Pospolita, or nobility or noble republic. Why this state is so important for us? Because on the one hand, it is exactly the story where or the period when Ukrainian, Belarusian, Polish and Lithuanian histories yeah, were part of the same political entity. Uh, secondly, it's very important because uh, if you look at this map again carefully, you'll see that, for instance, the entire territory of present-day Belarus was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Not entire territory of Ukraine was part of it. You see here, so here you have kind of, again, like this kind of a border, imprecise border between the Commonwealth and the so-called wild steppe. So the terrain of uh, not just nomads now, but also the terrain of the Ottoman Empire, this huge, you see this huge big empire, and also Crimean Haned is part of it, and here some territories on the land. So in other words, we see already here that for Ukraine, this category between East and West could mean two different things. And that's very important for our topic indeed. So on the one hand, we could interpret this notion between East and West as between Poland, no, let's say here, and Russia, the Russian Empire or the Moscovia, yeah, right? But we could and should also keep in mind another division, East and West. East in a sense of the Ottoman, Muslim world, and West as the world of orthodoxy and Catholicism, the world of um, traditions of uh, Polish same, if you wish, so kind of parliamentarism, even though limited to the noble strata. It was never, of course, for the peasants, for the entire population. As we all know, this huge state, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, was partitioned or divided between three empires, the Russian, the Austrian, and the Prussian, the German, if you wish. So this map maybe is a bit tricky, so you, you, might, you, you should kind of like imagine what is it about. So the biggest part, like this one, uh, green one, it was later part of Russia. What is important for us? What is crucially important for our topic here? Please look at this map carefully. You see, there are the borders of post-Soviet Ukraine, right? And here, this white spot here, that's the part of Ukraine that became, uh, that was integrated, if you wish, into the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So the empire of the Habsburgs. As you see, this part territorially is comparatively small. If you look at the rest of it, yeah, here you have uh, territories of Ukraine that were part of the Russian Empire. So here we have Kyiv, here is a huge uh, terrain of Katerinoslav, Governamol, here is Pontava, Kharkiv, Chernihiv. Kharkiv and Chernihiv are actually, as we all know, the areas of terrible war struggle nowadays. Here is Kherson area. Now, what is very important with this map? Actually, several things are very important. First of all, as you see, uh, the Russian or the Eastern part of uh, Ukrainian territory in the 19th century 
was much bigger than the Austrian one. Again, territorially, it's, you see, it's much, much smaller, this uh, white one. Uh, but in terms of cultural politics, in terms of religious politics, one could say, and a lot of people said, that in fact, this part of Ukraine played a crucial role in its, uh, let's say, in constructing the very idea of Ukrainian nation and the state. Why so? First of all, because uh, in the Austrian Empire, if compared to the Russian Empire, there was never such a severe censorship against Ukrainian language publications. It means if some books were not allowed to be published in Kyiv or Kharkiv, they could be published here in Lviv, so the biggest city of the region in Ukrainian Lviv, in Polish Lviv, in German Lemberg, in Yiddish Lvov, and so, so on. Uh, now, second point, uh, it was, as, as I've already said, it was the Austrian Empire uh, who invented the very notion of so-called East Galicia, Ost Galician, right? And the center of East Galician was again the city of Lviv or Lvov here, right? Uh, and what also Austrian Empire did, Austrian Empire also decided to support the so-called Union Church or the Greek Catholic Church. So again, please like try to imagine it when, maybe let's go back for a while, when Ukrainian territories were part of this huge Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth here, yeah, in the year 1596, uh, Polish rulers supported uh, the project, the religious project, that uh, the part of the Orthodox clergy, because Orthodoxy was the leading religion in Ukraine and Belarus, yeah, should create a new church called the Greek Catholic Church. So on the one hand, still Greek, on the other hand, Catholic. Why Catholic? Because this church was subordinated directly to the Pope of Rome here, right? Yeah, Rome. And... Uh, that was a kind of a cultural product, if you wish, of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So it never happened in Russia, for instance, something like that. Russia remained orthodox. Now, what happened after the petitions of Poland? That is very important indeed. So the union of the Greek Catholic Church was completely destroyed, dissolved in the territories of uh, Belarus, yeah, here to the north, and the same happened in the uh, territories of Ukraine controlled by the Russian Empire, but this church survived in the Eastern Galicia, in the Austrian Empire. And that is why, again, please try to feel this important aspect here, that Ukrainian national project, unlike the Polish or the Russian one, it was never, in this context, in modern times, the project of one religion, or let's say one nation, one religion. So in case of Russia, it was like this. Russian nation orthodoxy. In case of Poland, it was Polish nation Catholicism, Roman Catholicism. In case of Ukraine, you could be Orthodox or you could be Greek Catholic, but you still belonged to this uh, national cultural project of Ukraine. And that was also very much the effect of what Austrian uh, Empire did on these territories. And now, last but not least, imagine that in early 20th century, the biggest Ukrainian historian, whose name was Mikhail Grushevsky. So he was, uh, he was born actually on the territory of present-day uh, Poland, in the city of home here. But uh, he uh, graduated, so he spent his youth in the city of Kyiv, at the Kyiv University. And then imagine he was invited to become a professor of Ukrainian history in Lviv. So in a, in a different country, in a different empire. Yeah, so the person traveled from Russia to Austria to become the a first professor of Ukrainian history ever. Now, uh, Groshevsky did a lot of interesting things as a writer and a historian. For instance, he claimed uh, in a number of very serious publications, he claimed that the history of old Rus, okay, let's go back, 
to this medieval map that the history of old Rus belongs first and foremost to the history of Ukraine because its center was Kyiv, the same Kyiv in, as in the 19th century. But what he also did in one of his articles, and that's really amazing, like try to imagine it, he speculated that, uh, like, let's imagine what could have happened if in case of Ukrainian national project, we've had the same uh, trouble as uh, the conflict and the contest, if you wish, between the Serbian and the Croatian uh, national projects in the former uh, first Ottoman Empire and then in the state of Yugoslavia. And he warned actually that there is a danger for such development. And he was implying like that East Galicia could move in the Croatian direction and the rest in the Serbian direction, so to say. But again, dear colleagues, it never happened. It never happened. And it never happened because for Khrushchevsky, as well as for the absolute majority of Ukrainian intellectuals in that time period, there was one, let's say, top priority all the time. And it's also kind of a fascinating topic to discuss why so, but it was like that. And this top priority in Ukrainian was called Sobornist uh, in English, Okay, how to translate it? No, let's say unity. So it was always about unity of ethnographically Ukrainian lands. Doesn't matter whether they are in Austria or in Russia. Okay, what do we have next? Of course, we have the First World War and we have the series of revolutions, and not only in the Russian Empire, but in the Russian Empire, in our case, first and foremost. And after those revolutions, after the February Revolution, uh, the destruction of the monarchy, uh, there were various political projects all around the empire, especially on the borderlands. And the one in Ukraine was called the Ukrainian People's Republic. And this map, again, it, it's, it's not a very good and proper map, but just to give you a feeling that uh, in 1918, the territory of Ukrainian People's Republic was, you know, kind of like here in this blue corner, even though I should mention it, that uh, this state, socialist state, yeah, clearly said that we have aspirations for the entire ethnographic territory of Ukraine, which included also southern Ukraine and eastern Ukraine here, but not Crimea. So Crimea, for those people, it was considered to be a territory where Crimean Tatars should decide uh, which country and which form of government would they prefer to belong to. And here you have the so-called Western Ukrainian People's Republic, so in the old Austrian territories. And in the case of West Ukrainian People's Republic, the main problem was a fight against the Polish, uh, Polish troops. Polish national project, yeah. And in case of Ukrainian People's Republic in Kyiv, the main problem was a fight against Bolsheviks, yeah, headed by Lenin. And as we all know, uh, both uh, political projects, so both Ukrainian republics, they lost the battle, so they were beaten on the battlefield. But what we have as a result in interwar Europe, that's also a very important map. Look at it. So that's the map of Soviet Ukraine in 1920s, 1930s, in green color, yeah? At first, the capital city was here. You see Kharkiv, very close to the Russian border. That was the reason why so. Only later on, after the, you know, great famine and uh, some repressions, the capital was moved to Kyiv. It happened in 1934. Now, look, this part, so East Galicia and the rest of so-called West Ukraine, uh, it remained outside, so it was part of Poland and here Czechoslovakia, right? And Crimea was part of the Russian Federation, Russian Soviet Socialist uh, Republic, yeah, before the Second World War. So here we have Ukraine, uh, the borders of Soviet Ukraine uh, when the Second World War started. And uh, when the Second World War started, yeah, in September, 1939, at first the German troops, at, oh, here is Germany, you could see it a little bit of it, yeah. At first German troops attacked Poland 
and uh, very quickly seized uh, huge parts of uh, its territory. And then two weeks later, on September 17th, the Soviet troops also crossed to this border, yeah, and they took over West Ukraine and West Belarus. Let me show you some propaganda posters from 1939. You see here, there's the poster for Belarus. You have even Stalin's quote in Belarusian. And here is a poster for Ukraine. You see Ukrainian family in Ukrainian dress. Yeah, they are greeting a Soviet soldier. Here's Soviet tank, Soviet flag. Uh, now, dear colleagues, why this is extremely important uh, so this event in 1939, and then, of course, uh, the new borders, they were confirmed in 1945. And they were conceptualized in Soviet propaganda as the reunification of West Ukraine and West Belarus. Now, imagine it. Uh, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet state, who made uh, terrible crimes and, among others, crimes against uh, Ukrainian people, yeah, so the person responsible for the great famine, for oppressions, name it. Uh, at the same time, he followed in his uh, argumentation, yeah, in his, let's say, talks with the leaders of the Western states, he followed the same ethnographic logic or ethnographic argument as Ukrainian national movement in the late 19th century did. And Stalin said, uh, West Ukraine and West Belarus should be Soviet, should belong to us, because ethnographically is the same territory, the same people, the same Ukrainians. So it shows us how sometimes uh, arguments from a democratic emancipatory movement could be used by uh, the worst tyrants to solve their political uh, problems. And so after, okay, let's, let's maybe keep this picture for a moment. So, and so uh, as a, the result of Stalin's politics and as the result of the Second World War, uh, Poland lost, lost Western Ukraine. Yeah, it became part of the Soviet Union. But as we all know, it was rewarded, as it was said, by the territories in the West, among others, the territories on the Oder River, where I am lecturing nowadays. Uh, and historically, it was so-called East Prussia, yeah? Now, what is very important for us here? Actually, dear colleagues, when you hear, uh, or if you've heard like some years ago, this talks about two Ukraines, East and West, usually uh, West Ukraine was actually kind of, uh, supposedly, the region here, so this like old X, Ex Austrian, ex Polish uh, territories, yeah, the territories that belonged to Austria and Poland, and integrated into the Soviet Ukraine uh, in the course of the Second World War. What is important for us here that it was only, only after the Second World War that such uh, cities as, on the one hand, Lviv, on the other hand, Donetsk, on the one hand, Ternopil, on the other hand, Odessa, became part of the same state. Okay, so it never happened before. At least it never happened for a longer time period. Maybe it happened on a kind of a proclamation for a couple of days. Uh, but now for the first time it happened and it lasted for decades, as we know. And then, of course, the last important territorial change in terms of the borders was the decision of the Supreme uh, Council of the Soviet Union to transfer there's the term. You see that there's the regional uh, quote. It says, O Peredacia Krimskaya Ogunsi. So to transfer Crimean region from the Russian Federation to Ukrainian Soviet People's Republic. You could read this document. You'll see that uh, it uh, says that it was decided to do that in 1954, uh, keeping in mind the economic ties, territorial integrity, as well as cultural ties between Crimea and Ukraine. Uh, so in 1954, the formation of Soviet Ukrainian territory was ended, Yeah, came to an end. And then, of course, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. 
in 1991. It collapsed largely due to the active uh, position of the Ukrainian uh, communist elites. No time to go into details now. Uh, this map, again, is kind of a very tricky map. I'm always cautious with maps like that. I'm just showing it to you uh, to give this feeling First of all, those are the borders of post-Soviet Ukraine, right, with Crimea, with the entire territory. And secondly, it kind of strives to give this feeling of the language divisions. Uh, that is difficult to do. And actually, I'm I'm always like I'm always saying that there is no way to easily describe a language situation in Ukraine using maps like that or using you know this let's say border approach. Why so? First of all, because in Ukraine, unlike many other countries of Eastern Europe, we do have a massive uh, phenomenon of situational bilingualism. So it's bilingual, Ukrainian and Russian, and it's situational. It means depending on the situation, concrete person prefers or chooses to use this or that language. Secondly, there is no clear historical or geographical border between Ukrainian and Russian in Ukraine. If somebody says you there is, it's you know it's just a, either wishful thinking or a mistake. There is no border like that, uh, and you could never say, uh, unlike in Switzerland or in Canada or in Belgium, that's maybe the best example, not far away from Amsterdam. Yeah, Belgium, that you have historical regions where dominates on the one hand French, yeah, on the other hand German. And then let's say uh, some other languages like the Niederländisch language. Um, why so? In Ukraine, it's not like that. First of all, because of the extreme, uh, let's say, ex extreme and violent, if you wish, population exchange. Uh, I am not talking just about, uh, you know, like the Great Famine or the Holocaust of the Jews, but also about population transfers made by Stalin and afterwards uh, deportations and stuff like that. I'm, of course, also talking about Crimean Tatars who were deported as a people from Crimea in 1944 and were not allowed to go back until the late Soviet Union and so, so on. But what is even more interesting, dear colleagues, even more interesting in this language, let's say, dimension, is that in Ukraine, again, unlike uh, many other countries, let's say some Baltic republics, yeah? So in Ukraine, there is no direct link between the preferred language of everyday communication and the person's political or geopolitical orientation. In other words, you could be Russian speaking and extremely, let's say, anti-Russian politically, or as I know some colleagues of mine, it could be Ukrainian speaking, but still belong rather to, you know, let's use this primitive definition, like a pro-Russian cultural orientation. So it's much more complicated and you could not grasp uh, this language diversity just in you know, easy terms like Russian speaking East, Ukrainian speaking West or something like that. It really, it does not help, but it's not the entire problem. Like the entire problem is of course, as usually in nowadays, it's political, yeah? And let me show you some uh, maps that are looking pretty scary. Uh, for instance, the maps of uh, voting at the presidential elections. Yeah, here you have this emblematic vote that led uh, to the uh, Orange Revolution, right? Peaceful mass protest in 2004. So here you have like, like one part of the country voted predominantly for one candidate, yeah, Viktor Yushchenko, who was considered to be pro-European, and another part voted for uh, Viktor Yanukovych, considered to be pro-Russian. Okay, we have no time to go into detail with these maps. Uh, what I could tell you immediately, that's what is important here. First of all, it is important to be aware that some politicians in Ukraine, they deliberately played this game of regional, uh, let's say, divisions uh, to achieve some uh, political goals. That's first. Secondly, if you look carefully, you'll see that the numbers right here on the border are not so impressive as here. Here you have like, like extremes. Yeah, you have 87%, 86%. But here in the middle, you have 37, 49, so 43. So it, it's really not like, like it's not, there is no way to draw precise this border. So it, it is kind of, you know, you know, manipulative in itself. Even though, again, dear colleagues, if you remember the old maps, you'll see that this line kind of more or less, more or less historically corresponds to the old 
line between the steppe and the uh, forest zone in Eastern Europe. I'm against this interpretation of the elections. I'm very much against it, but it still shows us some, you know, kind of continuity of the uh, deep historical factors when it comes to political decisions made by people who maybe have no idea about history at all. Okay, another example, another revolution, yeah. So presidential elections in 2010, uh, very much comparable picture. Now it's Timoshenko Yanukovych. And of course, as we all remember, uh, Yanukovych uh, remained president only until uh, 2014, February 2014, uh, because the Maidan started in the autumn. Um, the trigger for this mass protest was the uh, president's decision not to sign an association agreement with the European Union. So Yanukovych paid a high price for this wrong decision. Uh, and now look, that's uh, the last uh, map from the last presidential elections, 2090, uh, right? Uh, the election when Volodymyr Zelensky, who is the president of Ukraine now, was elected. Look at this amazing map. Yeah. So in this case, Dolensky is green, and you have only this part of Ukraine. So it's Lviv Oblast, yeah, where uh, Petro Poroshenko managed to get slightly more votes. Again, it's not, it's not a big difference, but he gets slightly more than Zelensky. The rest, the rest of Ukraine in the south, in the center, in the west like here, there's absolutely Ukrainian-speaking areas. They all voted for him. Of course, in Crimea, there was no vote because the territory was occupied by Russia. And here, there was also no vote, uh, parts of Donetsk and Lugansk regions, but the rest of Ukraine voted President Zelensky, despite all the regional differences, despite the fact, if you wish, that uh, Zelensky was predominantly Russian-speaking, person at the moment, yeah. And also despite the fact, it's very important actually, that Zelensky consciously and consistently avoided the topics of history, identity, memory, you know, language uh, in his presidential campaign. And it was exactly what Ukrainian people wanted to hear. So, in other words, uh, this result uh, shows that, in fact, there is no, how to put it, like, you know, like tragedy or unresolved problem with the diversity. There are uh, ways, also political ways, uh, to solve this problem. And, of course, as we all know, what is going on now, this terrible war and uh, everything that uh, Russian aggression did to Ukraine, it's, it's a new, let's say, new stage, or new, let's say, yeah, yeah, new stage, new paragraph in the history of uh, Ukrainian uh, regionalism, Ukrainian nation, Ukrainian state building. But of course, it's too early, unfortunately, it's too early to make some sociological or historical conclusions about it. Uh, but again, even before this war, you see, even before this war, uh, we have something that is rather different from this idea of deeply divided country and unresolved national issues. Okay, I'm not sure whether I should do that or not. Uh, maybe just let me very briefly like, give you this feeling. You see here we have, of course, Crimea, yeah, occupied already in 2014. And it's very important for us, the last point for, for today, dear colleagues, it is very important for us to be aware that Putin's politics was and still is built in a kind of a historical argument, which is deeply false, but still it appeals to some, let's say, imagination about history. And also it appeals to the idea of the Russian Crimea. Look, for instance, at those medals, this one issued by uh, Putin in 2014, and this one issued by Catherine the Great in 1783. And uh, there is kind of a symbolic continuity in this imperial politics here. And I think it should be, uh, we, don't, we don't need it. It should be somehow, um, yeah, always compared, if you wish, again, to the presence and strengths of uh, the uh, territorial integrity and ethnographic argument 
pursued by Ukrainian movement since uh, 19th century. Thank you very, very much for your attention. I hope it was understandable and uh, kind of, yeah, not too chaotic for you. And I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this really fascinating talk. I hope you could hear the clapping here in the room. You have a really big crowd. So um, thank you again. I suggest we start with questions from the room and then move on to uh, questions from the chat. Uh, Ellen. Thank you, Andre. It's, it's Ellen Luton here. We, we also have the pleasure to host you, and I'm very, very glad to see you, even if it's only online, um, and I send you many good wishes. Um, thank you so much for this lecture. My question is a question about more, I guess, about adding something. When you visited us earlier, you um, shared some really interesting reflections on the role that writers, uh, literary writers, play in present day discussions about Ukrainian identity. And I wonder if there's any way in which you could link uh, that point on the role that writers play in these discussions uh, to what you told us today. Uh -huh. Okay, now maybe I should ask Eva, should a response immediately or should we collect the questions? I don't know, what, what's better, let's say, for the format? I, I suggest we answer the questions one by one. Okay, very good, very good. So thank you, thank you so much, dear Erwin. Actually, you're right, uh, one could say that writers played the most prominent role in the formation of Ukrainian national project. People like uh, Taras Shevchenko, Olesya Ukrainka, uh, a prominent female writer, right? Uh, Ivan Franko. And to some extent, uh, we could say that also nowadays, uh, writers are important, even though I would say, of course, it's, it's incomparable to the 19th century. Yeah, the era of romanticism and this idea of a written uh, word. And again, if we read uh, carefully, for instance, Shevchenko or other uh, Ukrainian writers, we'll see that uh, depending on their regional uh, background, they could focus on you know, telling the stories of one part of Ukraine or another, but you always have this presumption of sobornist or the territorial and cultural unity of Ukrainian lands. And for instance, when Mikhailo Kutsubinsky one of the biggest uh, prose writers of Eastern Ukraine uh, devoted uh, his most important novels to what? To the story of people who live in the Carpathian Mountains, so in the Austrian Empire. It came so naturally because, again, like for him, it was part of, of the one same body, Ukrainian culture and territory. So in this sense, Ukrainian literature, as well as Ukrainian historiography, played, uh, yeah, I could say a decisive role, a decisive role in the formation of political project uh, for Ukrainian territories. Absolutely. Um, hi, um, thanks for the uh, it was really interesting. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you uh, one question about a particular work you're using uh, sub um, and you said again in your response, and uh, maybe this is a little narrow, but um, this is obviously another big word in, in Russian uh, ideology, uh, or Russian philosophy. So I wonder if if uh, you can speak about how maybe uh, Rushevsky might have understood that word differently than someone like uh, Kamyakov or Kirievsky, the, you know, the Russian Slavophiles. Um, uh, if you can speak to that, that's my question. Yeah, thank you so much. So I, I hope I've heard correctly <laughs> what, what you've said. Um, you see, Hrushevsky, uh, it goes without saying, he was raised and he developed himself as an intellectual, first and foremost in the Russian intellectual milieu. And he was well aware of uh, everything, you know, done by Khomyakov and other people, yeah, we could mention here. Uh, Khrushchevsky was also, and he remained until his death, actually, and he was a socialist. So he believed in a socialist solution of political problems. And 
even up to the point that in the 1920s, he decided to return to the Soviet Ukraine from his emigration in Austria, uh, because he considered uh, Soviet Ukraine in the 20s being a Ukrainian socialist state. Uh, so what was kind of the difference, if you wish, or the importance here? You see, Rushevsky um, tried his best, um, tried his best to emancipate uh, Ukrainian past from the very beginning, so from the medieval times, from on the one hand uh, Russian historical narrative, on the other hand the Polish historical narrative. And his famous article, uh, where actually he proposed this idea that we should clearly define between Ukrainian history on the one hand and the Russian history on the other hand, and Belarusian on the third hand, right? It was published in 1904 in St. Petersburg, yeah, so in the publication of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And uh, as you could imagine, not every uh, Russian historian was happy about his argument, but still there were some people um, also in Russia, some Russian historians who considered Khrushchevsky idea that one should not start the proper history of the Russian people and Russian state from the Kievan Rus to be relevant. Yeah. Uh, and in this sense, so he was not like, let's say, yeah, like a Savona film. Uh, uh, he was more devoted to this idea of making Ukrainian history um, a subject, making it a subject, not just a part, you know, of the Russian or Rus history, uh, making it a subject. But at the same time, as I already said, uh, he believed, uh, he seriously believed, like no jokes, he believed in the ideals of a socialist federation. And as a politician, he was a supporter of this idea of the federation of socialist uh, nations, like Ukrainians, Russians, Belarusians, and so, so on. It never happened, as we know, but it was his political program till the end. Okay, I suggest we continue with questions from the room. Um, we also have some questions um, online, questions about Zelensky, but I suggest we perhaps take the questions first that are more related to the, um, uh, to the talk. I would perhaps like to follow up with a question of my own, which is um, somewhat related to Ellen's question. Um, how does the work of Oksana Zabushko feature mm -hmm. in this wider identity project? Mm -hmm. uh, again, so you see, dear colleagues, we could, of course, discuss in detail what Oksana Zabushko wrote, what Yuri Androkhovich wrote, and many, many others. Um, I think, let's put it this way. First of all, it is very important, for instance, in Germany, like in German context, where I have to, to live like for, for, the, for the last years, it is very important to be aware of the fact that Ukrainian literature uh, started not from Zabushko or Androkhovich, yeah, but it started, uh, okay, in modern sense, in the 19th century, and in early modern sense, we have Ukrainian writers already in the, you know, 17th century, 16th century, 18th century, and so, so on. Actually, a lot of them wrote in uh, Polish or in Latin language, but again, writing in Polish does not mean, that's a kind of a question mark here, yeah, that you couldn't be a Ukrainian writer. And the same goes, dear colleagues, for some Ukrainian writers nowadays who uh, write in Russian or in Russian and Ukrainian, because there are also such cases. And it's really fascinating to look how this, again, how this language identity could be linked to the national identity or to political identity, yeah? And coming back, for instance, to uh, Oksana Zabushko, she was clearly, like she clearly identified herself in uh, Ukrainian language and, and cultural terms. Yeah, right. Um, and I remember, for instance, when I was a student uh, in Dnipro, so in uh, southern eastern Ukraine, I remember this uh, text from her I've read. It was a criticism 
of Yuri Andrukhovich essay about Kyiv. Because Andrukhovich, who later on also became a very good colleague and friend of mine, he uh, live, uh, he lives, he still lives, of course, in East Galicia, in the city of Ivano-Frankivsk, Stanislaviv. So he went to Kyiv and he write an essay he wrote an essay that uh, in Kiev uh, he feels kind of uncomfortable because it's uh, it's too big, it's too Russian speaking, and so so on. And Zabushko kind of protected, you know, Kiev from uh, Andrukhovich. Why I'm saying that? I'm saying that uh, to make clear that uh, there is event that changed a lot. Uh, this let's say literary narration. I mean, of course, the annexation of Crimea and the start of the war in Donbass. Because you see, before this war, again, it was so unimaginable to have something like that in Ukraine, so violent physical war, right? There were some writers who kind of, you know, made jokes, yeah, or made some, you know, funny comments on the possibility to get rid of Donbass or Crimea. I remember like myself writing an article about that and actually crit criticizing such attitude. But again, uh, we should not overestimate it because it was more in the context of, you know, like intellectual, yeah, imagination, if you wish, provocation. But after uh, the annexation of Crimea happened and the war started, I've noticed that uh, all of them, so Andrukhovich, Zabushko, and other people, they've really started being, uh, let's say, much more focused on this idea of territorial integrity and unity of Ukraine. And the same actually goes to those questions from uh, YouTube or whatever about Zelensky, because again, to understand the success of Zelensky, dear colleagues, seriously, we should be aware that Zelensky was elected not, you know, just at some point, he was elected after several years of a terrible war conflict in Donbass, right? And Zelensky promised, maybe in a naive way, that's a different story, but still, he promised to find a solution to this issue. He promised to stop war. And a lot of people, they, of course, wanted it. They wanted to have, like, a, you know, a new start for Ukrainian project. And again, if we could say that this uh, like vote for Zelensky was on the one hand vote against war, that's for sure. It was also a vote against uh, Poroshenko, so previous president, who unfortunately involved himself in various uh, corruption scandals. So it was very much a kind of an anti-corruption vote, right? But still, keeping this in mind, I, I could tell you the same, like I'm telling like now to, to, to everybody, to members of my family, that uh, me personally, I've never voted for Zelensky. He was not my candidate. But uh, for different reasons, for various reasons, he proved, or let's put it this way, he found himself as a politician, as a leader of the state, exactly in the context of the war that started on the 24th of February. In other words, you have Zelensky before 24th of February and after. And Zelensky after is a different person indeed. Um, and uh, again, it's about dynamics. You see, uh, history writing uh, is very much about dynamics. We should never treat uh, like any historical conclusion, also mind conclusions, you know, as like the final eternal truth. It's never the case. It's always dynamic and it's always contextual. So we need to contextualize. Zelensky, Zabushko, you see two, two uh, Z family names, Andrukhovich and many, many others. If we do a proper contextualization, then we are good historians. If we are avoiding contextualizations, then we could end up in a trap like the one uh, Putin uh, presented in his articles on history. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions from the room? Or could we perhaps move on to those questions that we see appearing online? Um, Andri, um, you have a couple of questions um, in the Q&A. Would you like to choose one and perhaps discuss it briefly? And we can also see those. One is about linguistic identity, um, one is about the link between the dominant language and political preference, and one from our colleague uh, Ur Ungor is about um, 
about uh, language and citizenship. Very good. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll let us talk about it because it is uh, important and relevant. So first of all, let me maybe start uh, with Ur's questions, my old friend and good colleague from the Netherlands. Um, it is important to mention, for, for some reason I've like forgotten to do that, that in Ukraine in 1991, unlike, unlike Estonia, unlike Latvia, for instance, uh, citizenship was automatically given to any person who lived on the territory of the Soviet Ukraine uh, in December, so when the Soviet Union collapsed. In this sense, uh, in Ukraine, there was never, never, uh, a kind of a clash or a conflict between the language you speak and the citizenship, right? And that's, again, that's a big uh, important difference between Ukraine and some Baltic states. Uh, why it was done like that? I think it was done like that, uh, again, to understand this logic. Of course, we should again go back to Soviet uh, nationality politics, to Soviet language politics. Uh, we'll see that uh, in Ukraine, as well as in Belarus and other republics, but not all of them on the same scale, we have this idea of, uh, first of all, bringing Ukrainian closer to Russian, especially in Brezhnev times. And secondly, this idea to introduce as much education in Russian language instead of Ukrainian as possible. But, dear colleagues, despite these attempts, again, especially in the 1970s, the Soviet Union never stopped or never ceased uh, to uh, count or to classify its citizens according to their nationality, nationalist. Uh, if you wish, in English, it would be more like ethnicity. So nationality, Soviet nationality was not citizenship, was not citizenship. They were all citizens of the Soviet Union, me, myself, being born in 79. Uh, but it was about ethnicity. And this ethnicity was written down in all the basic documents in your internal passport. Uh, and this ethnicity was like that, Ukrainian, Jewish, Uzbek, Crimean, Tatar, Russian, and so, so on. And there was no way to have two ethnicities. You, you should have one. Even if you're, like, you're from the mixed family, doesn't matter. You should have just one. It could be either Russian or Ukrainian. I would say Russian or Jewish. Yeah, No way to have both. And that's, uh, you know, the condition where Ukraine found itself. And in 1991, Ukraine decided, first of all, to stop, to stop uh, making note of ethnicity in internal passports. And secondly, to give citizenship to every person living on the territory of the Republic. And again, now going back to this linguistic identity, there was also another very interesting notion, dear colleagues, in the Soviet uh, official statistics, and that was the notion of mother tongue or native language. Radnaya Rich or Ridna Mova. So people were asked about their mother tongue during censuses, for instance. But again, try to feel this difference. Uh, Mother tongue was not about the language you prefer or you exclusively used in your everyday life. It was a kind of, again, it was kind of a declaration of your cultural background, if you wish. So we have numerous examples of people who would have said, my native language is Ukrainian but they would still continue speaking Russian, using Russian in their everyday life. That's a kind of an interesting notion. And that is why, again, when we have those data from, let's say, post-Soviet uh, sociological polls about uh, native language, we should be cautious because native language could sometimes mean the language you actually speak with your family, with other people, or it could mean the language you feel should be your language in terms of your cultural heritage. That's a really tricky situation here. And then once again, coming up from this point, even more tricky is to try to grasp like any link between uh, language preferences and uh, political orientation. Again, especially keeping in mind that uh, in some parts of Ukraine till nowadays, uh, Ukrainian would rather be considered the language of the village population, right? And the Russian as the language of the city, and city means education also. 
in this stereotypical view, right? And furthermore, if you wish to complicate it even further, there is a famous uh, mixture of two languages yeah, called Surzyk. Uh, so some people would say it's a, a mixture of bad Ukrainian and bad Russian, but there are also linguists uh, who would argue that, in fact, in terms of like pure linguistics, it's a separate language in itself. It has its own, let's say, rules of language development. And again, why it's important? It's important because it proves that in Ukraine we could not uh, see, if you want to be serious, we could not just speak about, let's say, Russian speaking Ukrainian or Ukrainian speaking Ukrainian. It is much more complicated. And the political implications uh, are like, even more complicated. And again, even more complicated nowadays, if you keep in mind that the areas predominantly bombed by the Russian troops, Mariupol, for instance, that is predominantly Russian-speaking Ukrainian. So again, if you want to follow this primitive uh, logic, uh, language-centered logic, which I uh, propose not to follow, we will see that the main victims of Putin's aggression, they are actually people who predominantly would speak mostly Russian, or rather Russian in the situation of uh, bilingualism I've tried to describe before. And that is also like an interesting, you know, constellation uh, to be aware of. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the room? Okay, go ahead. Uh, hello, I'll try to be quick. Um, uh, I've been puzzled by uh, the personality of Stefan Bandera. Uh, because I know in Russia, uh, it's uh, this term Benderovsi is used like a derogatory term, and it's tantamount, tantamount to, calling, to calling someone fascist. So, um, and in Ukraine, it's considered a national hero. Um, what is your position? So, first of all, maybe I could do it later, if I may, I could send a link to Eva or Christian, because I've published uh, intensively about Bandera, and I'm kind of tired of speaking about it again, because I've published those articles in Russian, in Ukrainian, in Polish, in French, in German, in all possible languages. And the point was always kind of the same. If we want to seriously, again, dear colleagues, that, that is my, if I may, you see, if you want to go deeper and not to remain on this, you know, like, Oberfläche, yeah, how it's said, like this, you know, like, just this, like, you know, easiest, easiest, almost propaganda level, we should try to go deeper. So if you go deeper, we'll see that uh, there are two different things. Uh, there was Bandera as a historical figure, a man who was a political terrorist, a man who became, uh, as a very young person, who became the leader of one of the radical and nationalist organizations, right? The person who spent almost the entire Second World War in Sachsenhausen uh, for doing what? For proclaiming Ukrainian state without German permission. And then the person who was killed by the KGB yeah, in Munich. Um, and believe me, this person, when he was still alive, uh, he was never considered to be the number one or the leading personality in Ukrainian national, political, or whatever movement. Never. And then we have a different story, dear colleagues. The story of the symbol or the myth, if you wish, the myth of Bandera. The myth of Bandera, on the one hand, as the, as you rightly said, as a fascist, as the biggest Nazi collaborator. On the other hand, the myth of a national hero, and so, so on. Again, what is important for me as a historian? First of all, it is important to feel this difference between history and mythology, or if you wish, history and memory, right? Uh, secondly, it is very important to be aware that when we are talking about, and when we're hearing about Bandera or Banderovci or Banderovci, yeah, as someone pronounced it, uh, we are 
usually talking not about this historical personality, this political terrorist from Sachsenhausen killed by the KGB, we're talking about this mythology, right? And if we ask ourselves how this mythology came to being, why it became so prominent, that's an interesting question because, you know, believe me, there were also other nationalists, other terrorists, other leaders of underground movements, but they never got such an attention as Bandera got. And so if you like, if you seriously ask ourselves why his name became such a symbol, we'll figure out something really, I would say, uh, typical in history, but still amazing and ironical, if you wish. So this mythology of Bandera yeah, was born out of the KGB killing of the person. And furthermore, out of the process that was uh, done against the killer, because the guy who killed uh, Bandera, he decided to uh, run away from the Soviets with his East German wife. Yeah, so he crossed um, the border in Berlin from East to West Berlin, and he went to American police and he uh, said uh, about what he did. In other words, there is a brilliant book about this story. I encourage you to read it. It was written by Serhi Plohi. Uh, um, and uh, this book actually uh, tells how, tells the story, how this myth was born. Okay. And if you are really curious about my attitude, my attitude as a historical attitude. Again, dear colleagues, I am not a politician here. I am not going to give, you know, like any, you know, whatever, like advices or slogans or suggestions. I'm trying to analyze what's going on. So for me as a historian, there is absolutely no mystery in Bandera as a historical figure. As I've just said, uh, far less important than it seems to be from this propaganda narrative on both sides. And for me, it's pretty clear the logic of this uh, Bandera mythology within Ukraine or outside uh, Ukraine. Uh, I just want to, again, like to try you to feel that this, uh, uh, let's say, growing popularity of his um, again, mythology of his image, uh, could be largely explained by the fact uh, how strong uh, his uh, name uh, was and still is used by at first Soviet and then Russian propaganda. So uh, when uh, some people are turning uh, Bandera into the biggest hero of Ukrainian history, they are, in my view, very much supporting the efforts of the KGB and later FSB in promoting him as anti-hero. I hope you could you could feel what I'm trying to say here. This is a very important point, not, not a propaganda point, but a deeper point about it. And I think that we should try our best as you know, as students, as historians, as cultural studies specialists, we should try our best to develop uh, a critical analytical and contextual attitude to any hero we'll be talking about. It could be Bandera, it could be Lenin, it could be Yusuf Pinsutsky, name it, doesn't matter. Uh, we should remain uh, analytical and critical. That's my biggest concern. Thank you. Um, perhaps I'll ask one final question if there are no questions in the room. Um, about this concept of national indifference, which was uh, mm -hmm. used by scholars of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, does it also apply, in your opinion, to Ukraine in the same period, so late 19th century, early 20th century? And I'm not only talking about the Austro-Hungarian lands, but also other territories of what is now Ukraine. Yeah, thank you, dear Eva. That's a very interesting question indeed, because you see uh, this notion of national indifference, it's a very beautiful metaphor, right? Yeah, it's very beautiful. And it shows us that, of course, of course, especially historically uh, looking, uh, we could not attribute any single person or even movement to just one national project. And in this sense, I actually how to put it, I like this idea that we should make ourselves very much aware 
of the fact that our language of modern uh, scholarship, modern sociology, modern history writing is very much based on the language of nationalism and the nationalist era. That is why there are scholars uh, who uh, rightly uh, speak about the dangers of methodological nationalism. One could say, I am anti-nationalistic, I am, you know, like leftist, pacifist, but when it comes to writing or talking about some topics, you have all those, you know, key categories of the nationalist worldview, which is very dangerous indeed. Now, where I see a problem with this national indifference, where I see a problem, you, look, when we say national indifference, even in the very structure of the phrase, yeah, we still start, or let's say, depart from the idea of national or nationality. If we are saying like, okay, they're, they're national and that's like non-national, yeah, indifferently national. But this like this negation is still kind of a confirmation that maybe there is something like a national, no, let's say standard, like, right, you have like national standard and some people are indifferent. I would say that for a lot of people, especially, of course, uh, peasants again, but not only, but not only in the 19th century, let's keep this, this time frame. Uh, the problem of nationality was non-existent. So I would even go further. I would say not just national indifferent. I would say that they just lived in a different uh, worldview or yeah, whatever we call it. And now attention uh, for them, it was non-existent. But there were uh, national activists, again, writers, historians, who believed, who very much believed that even if those people are not interested yet <laughs> in their nationality, we as intellectuals, we do know that they are, in this case, Ukrainians, right? Because they speak one of the dialects of this language. And that is why they also spoke about national awakening, right? Yeah, so those peasants, they're kind of sleeping, not being aware of their Ukrainianness or Polishness or whatever, and we should wake them up. And that is an interesting question here, like whether this nationalization that happened um, very much in late 19th century, also happened very much during the First World War, no doubt about it. First World War was a big nationalizing experiment for the entire Europe, Ukraine as well. So whether it was kind of, you know, inevitable, maybe not. And what I also know for sure, I remember those stories from doing some oral history in Poland when I was a student in Warsaw, as you rightly mentioned. I remember talking to people, you know, uh, who were resettled to Poland after the Second World War. So from, uh, let's say, East Galician territories, yeah, uh, that now became part of the Soviet Ukraine. And those people, they told me the stories how uh, they faced as small boys and girls, how they, they faced uh, the first Soviet census. And again, once again, dear colleagues, in Soviet statistics, every single person should have a nationality. There was no way for national indifference, exactly what we're talking about. And there were those people you know, like coming to the village and asking, okay, who, what is your nationality? And some people were just, you know, like incapable given any answer. Some were like trying to invent some names like uh, Orthodox or local. And they said, no, 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 no. We have a list. We have a list. And there is a list like Ukrainian, Russian, Jewish, Polish. So again, think about it. Already after the Second World War, in official Soviet statistics, uh, you have had to choose one of the names, national names, from the list. There was no place for national indifference or no place for your own, let's say, self, uh, let's say, self-identification. And this normativity, this normativity, of course, played an important role afterwards, as we all know. And it also played an important role, uh, for instance, during the Second World War, when uh, it came, for instance, to the problem uh, for the Nazi uh, regime and its collaborators, yeah, how to define Jews. Yeah, so they were first defined according to the Soviet documents and later on according to the Nuremberg laws and so, so on. So in other words, I think that national indifference is a nice and important category, but I still have a problem with this idea that even this category 
puts national, you know, first. When we say put, puts national into the first place. Uh, but that's our task, dear colleagues. Again, that's our task to try to be self-reflective about our own language, about terminology we use, and trying to be being aware that every terminology, every category we use, it has its own historical dynamics and historical meaning, and we could not just free ourselves from it. We are inside uh, the history of the language, the history of the disciplines, and that is what we have to be aware of once again, if you want to be good historians. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andri. Um, we'll leave it at that. This was a wonderful talk and an excellent discussion. Thank you so much for finding time to be here with us tonight. Um, all the best to your family, um, all the best in the months to come. And let's thank Andri once more for this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andri, and we hope to see you in person sometime soon. Yeah, same here, same here. Thank you so much indeed, and have a good night. Thank you. Good night.